Today we're talking about the spine and how to strengthen the spine. And the topic for today is that challenging exercises are often the best. Now this is really going to challenge what you may think about spine training and that uh, we're really gonna rock the boat here and talk about um, some of the exercises we use at Unity Gym. What's up everyone? My name is Yanni Bormeister. To my left is Phil White, recently uh, birthday boy. And across the table is Rad. Uh, behind the mixer is Richie. We are Unity Gym in the UMS. If you guys want to know how we turn driven people into athletes, you can learn all of our biggest insights, secrets, aha moments by downloading our three blueprints available in the description or on our website. Uh, this is a big show today. I'm, I'm actually quite excited about this discussion because it's, uh, it's a cl close to home topic for me. I spent many, many years with an injury identity of someone who'd fallen off a horse and really badly hurt my back. And, uh, I avoided the very things that became my, um, my solution. And, uh, I think that there's a lot of people that are going to fall under that, uh, into, into that group. I think there's going to be a lot of people that can relate to my story and, uh, I think that today's a, a great opportunity for all three of us, four of us, if Richie was mic'd up, to have, um, to provide a lot of value. How's everyone going? Good. Yeah. Yep. Fired up. Ready for it. Yeah. Fired up. This, um, this topic has been, yeah, really fun all week and, and it's, uh, yeah, I'm really stoked to have it as a resource to then point a lot of my back pain patients towards before they before even coming to see me to get yep. a really good understanding of, yep. you know, the approach to take. So, yeah. Yeah. This is a... Yeah, it's a really it's a, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because it it wasn't until it was it was probably only about five years ago that we started really incorporating this stuff into the UMS. Um, there was a you know a, a tipping point for us where we started to receive enough information about challenging the status quo around spine training that we decided to go against the grain, and um, and it's just worked out so well for for everyone. Yeah, um, we've fixed so many. Um, I, I won't even say fix so many spines. We've fixed so many people's belief around spines that's allowed them to then, you know, move into a pain-free existence and, yep. and being able to do the things that they thought were long, long gone. And it's a really amazing thing to watch someone who's in their 30s, 40s, 50s, even 60s who has this belief that my spine's stuffed and my days of being able to do the things I want to do are over, going from that to going, oh, my God, I can move again, you know? Yeah. It's it's um it is age reversing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Now we said something earlier on mm. in the week that we do say uh, often. Rad says it often, which is you're only as old as your spine. It's a is it a Chinese proverb? It's, it's a Chinese uh, proverb. I learned it now, from Ido Portal, but he says it's a Chinese. Proverb. Now there's something very important that we point out is that um, um, although your spine ages and the morphology um, will indicate that there are you know um, maybe even wear and tear and and um, they call it what is a degenerative spine disease or whatever it is where things start to sort of wear down and when you go and get a scan it looks like you've got a really old spine what we're referring to with an old spine is a spine that hasn't been moved and stimulated properly the supporting structures are weak and or tight uh you know I believe that you can you can have a healthy spine at any age. It's ju it just needs the right stimulus and it needs the right movement and it needs it regularly. And um, uh, so I just wanted to sort of clear that up. Um, now today we're going to be uh, sort of um, diving into a big big mistake that people make uh, in their training and in their in their development, which is to think that. You know, once you get good at a movement like a deadlift or a squat, or you get strong, then you are um, uh, you're, you're you're sort of invincible. You're not going to cause spasms in your back and things like that. But often, people who are really strong in in a movement like a deadlift still get experience muscle spasm or or uh, discomfort just by something as benign as picking up a suitcase when they're traveling or or um picking up a pencil off the floor you know yeah i've got a i've had a massive um back spasm where i could barely move after flipping eggs like yeah <laughs> it's just something totally innocuous like that so soft yeah that's yeah. exactly right and so <laughs> we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna address you know why that sort of happens and 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 also not to freak out about it you know like my, my most recent back spasm happened when I tried to run for a, a, a bus that I was about to miss. And it was after a really big le leg day, heavy leg day. And I was pretty sort of um, uh, stiff and sore, uh, had some serious doms. And I just jogged 
at a reasonably light pace and bang, I got a, a back spasm, you know, and uh, it, it, you, you kind of beat yourself up and think, why the hell does that happen? I was squatting 140 kilos yesterday, you know, and I'm so strong and robust. My, my egg flipping incident happened when I was, yeah, sort of it, like when I was just focusing on powerlifting, I was probably deadlifting around 180, 180 for reps at the time. And um, yeah, you know, you're feeling really strong, resilient, robust. And I definitely like my body felt better a lot of the time than it ever had before. But um, yeah, it's just these, these little things when you haven't incorporated movement variability into your training that... Oh, one of our um, insight right there. Insight, one movement of our, variability. What, write that down. One of our members, Simon, um, he threw he spas got a back spasm about two weeks ago from bending over and picking Notice up. Notice the one correction of, of terminology yeah. there. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Ben, bending over and picking up a dumbbell in the gym, and he was out off gym for about three or four days. It was it was quite painful for him, and he had another back spasm this morning. But he was saying how it was a fraction of what it was before, and he was able to continue the workout. And it's because a couple of weeks ago when he had his back spasm, I told him some things that he needs to do more of. And it was all about spine mobility stuff. And so today when it happened, he said, oh, look, I can feel it. But it's nothing like it was a couple of weeks ago, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. There you go. Yeah, there you go. I, so I want to just take a re little rewind and get Phil to repeat what he said just before there in, in uh, movement or load or exercise variability and why that's so important here. Because life is variable. Life is an ex oh, like your oh. <laughs> mic drop. <laughs> Bob's all over the place here, but um, yeah, in, in life, you know, there's lots of uh, unplanned movement. There's lots of reactive movement where you're just, um, you know, reacting to the environment, the stimulus around you. So if you've got kids that are running around, you have to stop them from, you know, constantly trying to kill themselves. The little lemmings that they are running onto roads and the like. So, um, or you know, catching. I'm, I'm the ultimate klutz. Like quite coordinated in sports, but then it comes to at home, I often will knock over it comes cups to and cooking eggs. Have to <laughs> yeah, but you know, I'll, I'll often be knocking things over, then quickly having to like lurch forward and reach to, to stop things. Or, um, oh, you know, even playing sports like this morning, I had a, a um, you know, an hour and a half of beach volleyball where, yeah, it's, it's very much quick movements, twisting, turning, bracing, and then getting up and hitting. So, uh, like, life is full, full, full of variability. And if in the gym you're not adding that variability into training and not progressively overloading variability, then you're not going to be prepared for what life has to throw you. Yeah. There you go. And that's why it is so important that you don't just stop at doing deadlifts or squats or even back extensions and all these amazing exercises that we do certainly encourage people yeah, to do. 100%. But it's not the be all and end all. It's not, it can't be the only thing you do. And that's why we include spinal mobbing in our warm up. And that's why we have um, courses like the Spine Mobility Masterclass to teach you because none of the heavy weightlifting movements that you're going to do in the gym uh, uh, train the multifidus and the deeper sort of um, uh, segmentation or stabilizers and the deeper muscles uh, in, in the same way. You well, know? they will train them and they will hypertrophy them in a to do the job of like, you know, sagittal plane isometric contraction, basically, which is uh, in layman's term is basically just like stiffening the spine in a yep. deadlift sort of movement. Um, but yeah, what we what we need just what we need to think about with the spine is it's just like the rest of the body where uh, contraction type matters. Um, you know, muscle fiber types matter. Energy systems matter. So if you're only training your um, spinal muscles in a heavy isometric way, then they're only going to be good at bracing in a heavy isometric way. And when you add movement in, suddenly they won't be, you know, exposed to that before. So the muscle fiber types, the energy systems involved, um, and just the mo mo like motor unit coordination um, will not be there because it hasn't been rehearsed. Yeah, and so can we and progressively? May, it might be it might be worthwhile to just sort of um, take a um, pause and explain, you know, in a in a very layman's term way, why we experience these muscle spa these painful muscle spasms. Um, because I think that kind of frames what we're trying to get at here a little bit, you know. It, to my knowledge, we experience a muscle spasm when the body experiences something that it's not really comfortable doing and it locks yeah, the if body anyone, down. If anyone here has been doing compression training, um, they'll all know all about uh, spasms when you're starting to work into ranges that maybe you haven't spent much time in before. And just as Joachim Hilderson said when he was on the show, like you have the two different types of um, cramps and we can kind of think about muscle cramps in a, and spasms in a similar sort of way where basically there's those kind of controlled ones where you're exploring ranges and, and contraction types that you maybe haven't spent much time doing before but then there's also you're sort of over you like you know, like when you've exceeded the capacity of your muscle to do work that's when it goes into 
um, spasm as a protective mechanism to be like, hey, we got to lock this down because I can't handle any more. Yeah. Um, you know, lengthening and shortening with control. Um, you know, you haven't built up the energy systems, you haven't built up the muscle um, motor units to um, handle that much capacity and so once you exceed that capacity it locks itself down and so usually what we're going to be seeing with muscle spasm in um in the back is is, is that we've exceeded the capacity and that generally comes from um, and that's why the advice around posture these days is that there's no inherently one bad posture but being in any one posture for too long is the thing that gets you so adding even movement variability in your day and how you sit or stand at work or um, go about your day or go for a little walk frequently, that's the kind of stuff that refreshes your muscles and means that you won't just exceed it in a you know low level is um, isometric yeah. sort of flexion that most people get stuck at sitting at a computer. Oh, I like that concept of refreshing the muscles. Yeah, uh, I've never heard that before. That's really, really good. Now, very quickly, I want to take a pause before we go any further. I want to uh, give a shout out to everyone that's viewing us on the UMS Movement Mastermind live stream. Give us a shout out. Let us know who you are, where you're tuning in from. Those of you over on the podcast and watching the replay on YouTube, you can jump over to the Facebook group, join the group uh, and jump on these live and ask us some questions. So remember, we get on the podcast. You can also send in little voice messages. As well, yeah, so there you go. Yeah, Phil does listen to them at night when he's alone, <laughs> stroking. Still uh, just that one from Grace. <laughs> Clemens about you know six months ago never night yeah <laughs> stroking his curls you know just the one curl yeah okay so um let's let's dive in to a little bit to about how we progress spine mobility um rad this is a good question for you um we obviously uh have sort of our, our um mobility warm-up where we introduce a little bit of spinal mobility drill um, but how do we progress spinal mobility? Recently, you just put together a great course that does this, uh, the um, Spine Mobility Masterclass. Mm -hmm. So what, what, for everyone who doesn't have that course, what does it look like to progress spinal mobility? Well, there's a really great way to think about spine mobility and, and really, um, you know, all movement training, it, which is you start with isolation, then you move to integration, and then you move to improvisation. So isolation has a really important place in spine mobility because what happens is for most people, most people will be will have some movement in an area of their spine and then very little movement in another area of their spine. So you can see it when you say to someone, you know, bend forward, and you'll see that either they'll get some good movement in the lumbar, or you know, the lumbar definitely doesn't get as much movement as the thoracic, but you'll see a bit of movement there, but not much in the thoracic, or you'll see a little bit of movement in the lumbar and up in the top of the thoracic, but not in the mid. Um, or like it's, it's or often you'll see people like, you know, even when they're bending forward, and you, it, it's all coming from the hips. Like yeah, there's exactly, you know, yeah, exactly. The ability to so the, at the first stage, you need to isolate the area that you're trying to create movement in. And there's different ways to do that. Like one of the, one of the earliest progressions that we teach people to do is to isolate the cervical spine. So to think of the shoulders from the shoulders down being completely rigid and you know, you're just moving the cervical spine and we do those ones, the neck circles. You can't see what I'm doing on the podcast, obviously. But then we also do, you know, these ones where you're- Lateral. And, yeah, yeah, lateral movement. So it's, it's just moving the spine in different ways and then you move so the cervical spine is the neck for those yep. playing at home and then the same thing would happen for the thoracic and for the whole spine you try to isolate different areas of the spine and then the integration phase is where you start integrating the whole spine so like spinal waves where you yep. start integrating full spinal movement and you're trying to bring every single joint into the movement that you're doing and then improvisation is at the most advanced level where for when we do our warm ups, which you may not have even been aware that this is what you're doing, but it's when you just start improvising yep. and you just start moving around and doing all different things and you just you have all these tools in your toolbox. And um, the, the problem, like even if you take, go away from the spine, like with general movement practice is that people, you know, whenever you look at the cool videos of the people on Instagram or YouTube, you're usually watching people that are in that improvisation stage and then people try to replicate that and they don't understand the phases of how to get there. Yep. So that's the most important uh, yeah, concept to understand. Bringing like progressive overload to kind exactly. of a skill level as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Right. And when you're talking about when, when we do, when we teach spine mobility, you know, the loaded mobility comes in at a much later stage. First, when we do the isolation and the integration phase, there's no loading of the spine. It's just learning how to um, how to create movement in in you know each area, and 
it's a really hard thing for a lot of people to do. You know, when you're trying to do something that you've never done before, it's it's even like trying there's to not, test. There's no neural connection. Yeah, that's right. It's like, I, I, I've had this frustration. Mm. Like I've had a very stiff neck and I used to have to constantly crack my neck. Like it would feel like the muscles were cramping down slowly over the day. And then eventually I'd go and, and it'd click and then it'd feel like, hey, for another hour or two. And I'd go through that cycle. My mum has the same thing. And I don't know um, what it is or what causes it, but since doing our spinal mobbing, it doesn't happen anymore at all. It's really quite interesting, you know, and I'd spoken to chiropractors about it and all of that, and they sort of would go, oh, yeah, I would avoid cracking your neck if you can, you know, but it would feel so uncomfortable if I didn't crack it, you know? Yep. I don't know yeah, if anyone else out there can like, relate oh, yeah, to that. Yeah, 100%. I, you know, I get that as well, and it's it's often coming from a time where you you know you, you've been in one position for a long time, and um, when you start to like your active structures that support your neck get overloaded, like they exceed their capacity, so your head's a pretty heavy thing. And if like at first, if you're sitting with that sort of more upright posture, then you, your muscles are the thing that's are doing the work there. And then as they start to get tired, you just kind of sink, and your chin comes forward, and mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, know, then you're relying more on that sort of end range passive structure. Um, sort of support for uh, your head and when yep. it's your passive structures so that's your bones your your discs your ligaments um they start to get into position which um you know then the crack is just basically uh you know the, uh, what the crack exactly is like if it's nitrous oxide bubbles or um in the joint that's moving basically it just you know is making you kind of then reset and then you're going back into a more active kind of <laughs> support of your head until you sink back into that position. Yeah, <laughs> right. So. Mm. Yeah, look, I, I, I know for f- like the, the one thing I can say without, without, with all certainty is that since doing a little bit of spine mobbing every day, uh, it has... When you say mobbing, mm-hmm. sorry, just for the physio in me um, and anyone who maybe has that background, mobbing often means like uh, actually getting in there and, and moving the spinal vertebra with like your hands yeah, or, or with, right. a, with a tool. So just to be clear, it's yeah, like yeah. the spinal mobbing that you mobility know, yeah me okay clarifying yeah. for anyone else who's got the yeah, same yeah, yeah. Me. <laughs> so, so spinal mo- spinal mobility yeah. uh and um that that has changed the the game for me it's made my neck feel so much better so much better. everyone does and you experience it, it's probably one of the most rapid reductions of uncomfortable chronic pain that people experience when we teach them is when they start doing spine mobility it, it happens so quickly the change that you feel within your body when you when you dedicate you know two to five minutes a day if you it's really about that daily practice um, it's not something you need rest from um, it just happens so quick that people start saying oh my god I cannot believe how much better my neck feels or my lower yeah. back or my shoulders or whatever it is like it's a really it's an amazing thing yeah, yeah life just you don't just don't move as much as we we used to and especially if you're like at home and you're not even like turning your head to look over and check your blind spot if you're driving to work like (laughs) you know it's just you can get so locked into a position if all you do is at the computer or on your phone and and because the thing is like if you if you work on a farm or if you you know work on the land your spine is going through so much movement just from what you're doing just from bending down picking things up from grabbing something off the ground and putting it on the truck yeah. you know like whatever it is like it, it goes through movement so you have to think that if you're not doing that if, if if you get out of bed and you kind of put your arms above your head and then you get in a shower and then you go and sit down at a desk all day long like, there's just none of that going on yeah, yeah. and that's um, why those muscles that control that specific position you're going to be in are going to exceed their capacity they're only going to get overworked and they're going to get tired yeah and spasm so. yeah so um before we get on to deadlifting and how to introduce and progress deadlifting morning, I want Quark, to just, by the way and oh, morning dave and lee yep. and andy uh i want to just quickly talk about rotational training because it's a hot it's a bit of a hot topic it used to be really really popular and it's sort of faded out in popularity a little bit um and i want to get your take on it phil because i'm not so much a fan of rotational training as I am a fan of anti-rotational training. And, um, and, and what, what I mean by that is that you, you take a, a load that would um, pull, the, you pull your torso into rotation, whether you're supine, prone, or standing, or kneeling, or half kneeling. And, um, and then you, you brace uh, using your obliques. And, and For those who are confused about uh, supine and, and prone, just remember supine is on your spine. 
Sophia. Sue Pine's on your spine. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, and prone is face down. Yeah. Prone um, is not on your spine. <laughs> yeah, and so you can, you, you know, there's all different ways that you can do anti-rotation training. Uh, you can even do it hanging, you know, from from rigs and bars and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, anti a, a very classic anti-rotational um, movement progression is things like the flag and side lever in calisthenics. Um, yeah, that's a pretty pretty far down that's the line. That's ex extreme, yeah, <laughs> no, that's yeah, pretty, yeah, yeah. Pretty easy. Um, Three weeks of but, training. But I've certainly in my in my rehab for my spine used paloff presses and half kneeling paloff presses and, and uh, you know, anti-rotational sort of wood chop movements with cables and bands and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, and I'm a big fan of those. Uh, what are your thoughts with rotation Yeah, I think, training? Um, you know, there's there was kind of this big argument of, like in the past about like whether or not you only have a certain amount of rotations and, you know, life that your spine can handle but i don't buy that like i don't see why yeah. you know why that one movement would have any sort of special thing compared to everything else it's all about like progressively overloading and and i but the thing is like you know with rotational stuff like i don't see the big kind of win in really pushing strength into the end range there because like it doesn't like it's you know not something that has massive sort of like functional transference and so like it, definitely rotation is a key thing in sport to like throwing you know today playing volleyball hitting Paddling, like rowing, you're, you're going to be doing boxing um that but there's and and with golf like you're playing on the weekend but there's yeah. been a lot of good research to show that like you know say for example if you had like a weighted club doing like you know a resisted rotational skill thing doesn't have transfer then into like yeah. good skill um, development. So yeah, I think, um, you know, yeah. anti-rotation is a great way of introducing kind of rotational strength and then maybe, you know, adding in sort of some level of <coughs> resistive rotation, but it's just not one of those things that's worth sort of maxing out in because you got to think about the kind of cost benefit analysis and, yeah. um, you know, there is an inherent risk if you are not controlling end range rotation yeah. more so than probably other movements. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I, I like to say, do your rotational training in the sport that you're practicing and build strength in anti-rotation and other movements. And that tends to have a really good carryover yeah. in my experience. Yeah. Uh, okay. So... Uh, deadlifting and heavy squatting. Here's the, like by far and large, my favorite way to train the spine when you start to get a little bit more experience, but even when you're a beginner and I'll quickly just, you know, pre-frame by sharing very, very quickly my story with deadlifts and squats. Um, I avoided them until my mid twenties because I had formed a really strong injury identity after falling off a horse when I was about eight years old and getting dragged. Um, and it really, really messed up my lower back. Um, and, um, it, uh, I had um, like reoccurrences and, and, and issues right throughout my teens and 20s. And um, when I eventually started hanging out in a gym, I really avoided fr most free weights because of it. You know, I did chest press and, and uh, chin ups, but I didn't do squats or deadlifts at all because it, they seemed to trigger spasm in my back whenever I tried them. And uh, I was very, very um, uh, stiff in the hamstrings and, and, and quite unflexible at the time. So it was, it was difficult for me. So I sort of stuck to le uh, leg press and leg extensions and things like that to train my lower body. And as a result, um, I never really um, solved the problem. And it wasn't until my mid-20s when I started hanging out with people that knew a little bit more about weightlifting than I did that I was encouraged to start deadlifting doing the most extreme form of deadlift that I um, really ha could think of, which is um, a snatch grip, which is a very, very wide grip like they do in the Olympic snatch, um, a deficit deadlift that forces you through a deeper range of motion. And, you know, to do that, to execute properly, you've got to really lower the weight. And it's more about loading the structures through a really big range of movement. It's not about maximal load. Um, and I did that, uh, you know, consistently for, for about the a thing month. Is though, when you're doing like, it's when you're loading, when you say loading through a large range of motion, your spine is still like ideally in an isometric neutral. So it's, that's more yep. about getting your hips and going Hi it's through. It's about the hips. Yeah. yeah. That's right. It's about the hips going through a deep range of movement. And you know, it, it made sense to, to work for me because it was my lower back that was the compromised area. And you know, I didn't have very good flexibility when I started doing this and it really went against everything that I had formed beliefs around and dogmas around. I really just didn't like deadlifts because every time I did one, it, no matter how light, 
uh, up to about 60 or 80 kilos, my back would um, go into severe spasm and I'd be out for weeks, you know. And it was the same with squatting. I found squatting really, really difficult for me. And it wasn't until, and I, I had tried them, I attempted them, I worked out with friends and, and it was just an area that really nailed me. And it, we spoke about this yesterday, about the psychology around forming an injury identity and how that can really, really become a self-fulfilling prophecy for you, you know. But when I did this snatch grip deficit deadlift protocol, which m had me doing it three times a week, and I did that for four weeks, uh, doing a high, high amount of volume, uh, low intensity, uh, that was the f thing that fixed my back. And it's, and, and it, it, you know, at the time it didn't make a lot of sense to me. I just couldn't get why that worked. But I've since done that with a lot of other people and, uh, and clients, and it has had the same result. And, um, you know, it's one of those things like I'm really apprehensive to prescribe it to someone with a really compromised back because there is a risk and reward yeah, there. Yeah, I think you one know? of the things with like, you know, such a challenging exercise like a snatch grip deficit deadlift is it, it really makes you focus. Like it, it, you you are doing that and nothing else because like generally when it's programmed like it's it's going to be a whole lot of volume on just that one thing and it and the way that the exercise is generally structured with the slow eccentric means that you know you're putting so much effort into like focusing on keeping your your back in, in that position throughout and so it's a great way of getting kind of your, your focus really honed in on on that one particular part of the movement um which when you're introducing something like a deadlift um, or a squat, like people sort of think it's a fairly simple movement, but there's so many different movement cues that you have to get right. So having sort of like a that kind of keen focus on really, you know, just holding that position and getting plenty of isometric, um, you know, resistance uh, kind of time into it, I think is just to, yeah, probably why it's getting the job done. And yeah, it had an incredible effect on and, me. And because of, you know, what we spend most, like our, spine the main role throughout the day is sort of you know isometric extension and, and basically keeping you upright and so the that snatch grip deficit deadlift is just like s really bringing up your ability to kind of maintain isometric um you know extension. and it's also because it goes um through such a like it takes you through such a, a large range of motion because you're doing a deficit and because you're gripping wider that both of those things bring you lower to the ground but also because you're gripping so wide the amount of upper back activation that happens in yeah. it. So it's just your entire back and posterior chain that's um, going through this constant isometric contraction, um, but also doing a, um, you know, a dynamic, a, 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 um, uh, you know, a, a normal concentric contraction and eccentric contraction in the um, in the muscles that control the hip joint. So it's, yeah. it's yeah. an amazing movement, isn't it? So that's one that's one movement that most people frown upon and think, oh, that's ridiculous. That's had a profound impact on myself and many of my clients. The next one mm -hmm. is even more controversial, which is the Jefferson curl, the loaded Jefferson curl. Now I have a gentleman who tra has trained with me. He's trained with Richard, and as of next week, he's training with you who's had a compromised back um, since playing rugby as a young guy. And he's been, you know, when he first came to us, he'd been to see three surgeons who all said he needed to have a spinal fusion and a discectomy and all sorts of um, pretty horrible stuff done. And the fourth surgeon sort of talked him out of it and said, you know, I don't want to operate on you until you've lost weight anyway. So I suggest you go to a personal trainer and do some work with them, get your weight down and then come back and we'll have a talk about doing the, the, the operation. And and uh, after two years training with us, he um, largely had um, uh, no back reoccurrences. Uh, he every once in a while has a little bit of a flare up. Since COVID has been saying that his back's not feeling very good anymore and he's coming back to train again. Now, the one exercise that seems to and give over, him... Over that time, he lost 25 kilos, didn't he? Uh, yeah, yeah, did really well. Did yeah. really well. So that's going to make your back feel better as well. A absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's a very valid point. Um, but the one exercise that he gets the most satisfaction out of whenever his back is feeling like it's flaring up or feeling really uncomfortable is the Jefferson curl. And he doesn't go super heavy. He only does about up to about a 16 kilo... Uh, weight. Uh, we, I usually start him when he's in, in all sorts of on a 10 or 12 kilo. We do a deficit Jefferson curl so he can really bend over. So that by that, I mean he's standing up on something that's raised like a block so that he can go, the weight can go beyond the floor. And yeah, he says, mate, I've been trying different things and different techniques and different stretches and different exercises for the last decade. And that's the one exercise that seems to really, really help him. 
and it's such a it's a, it's such a controversial exercise. So many like we've been pulled up posting photos of us doing Jefferson curls by chiropractors all over the country saying, "Oh, that's a that's a means to destroy your back." You know this and that. Um, yeah, well, let's let's talk about that a little bit. If Rad would stop typing and engage in the conversation, uh, I'm engaging in the conversation. <laughs> I'm I'm responding to people. Um, look, I think it's um, it, it is without a doubt one of the most controversial topics that we ever post about. Whenever I've ever posted a picture of me doing loaded um, spine flexion, and I can get pretty deep in it, like my body's pretty well compressed against itself when I'm doing it. And, I, and I've posted some pictures of me doing it with some, some pretty decent weights, like 35 kilogram dumbbells in each hand, so a total of 70 kilos. It's almost body weight. Um, there's always some haters on there. There's some people that really just chime in and go, oh my God, how could you do that? And it's so bad for you and it's this and that. And and the answer is always, well, well, what are you basing that off? And they're always pulling up some research. It's always, they'll, there's always there's plenty of research out there that'll try and prove that what we're doing is, is wrong. But the answer for us is always the same. It's, well, we would, we're not saying if we're a beginner to go and get 35 kilogram dumbbells and go into forward flexion with it. Like that would wreck some people just as much as it would say to somebody, I have never back squatted before. Let's put your body weight on the bar and we'll get you under it and see how you go with it. Like it's the same thing. So... It's something that through exploration and through gradual exposure has progressive overload. Progressive overload to say. has <laughs> yeah, yeah well, sure yeah has <laughs> produced phenomenal results in um, you know I think I was the first one to explore it out of all of us you know and then I started getting great results and you guys started to explore it and you started getting great results and we started giving it to our members and they started getting great results so you know you might want to. You might pull up whatever outdated research you want to find on it, but try it yourself. Do it for six months and, and see what the results yeah. you get, you know? It's, it's one of those things where, you know, there's such it's just such a cultural thing to be so protective about the back in the kind of old school uh, sense. And, and, you know, it's and people sort of apply different rules to the back with any other, you know, than any other part of the body. And I think, you know, it, like... It's amazing kind of to me that um, you know like people watch the Olympics and see gymnasts do incredible things or go to the circus and watch you know contortionists and um, you know and people in the circus do all these kind of amazing things and then sort of just think like oh no but for regular people they you know yeah, like they then train that's like the that, most yeah. like dangerous thing in the world and like th there's just kind of that you know there's there's gray with everything like you you don't have to be push like you know, pushing to what the circus people do, but you can be kind of, you know, doing like a step, step by step kind of approach to doing some of the movements that, you know, that they'd be doing. So I think it's, yeah, it's just one of those things where people sort of see the extremes and don't understand that, you know, there's, you're not going to go from zero to 100. Yeah, and it's just, not, and it's also like when you see the extremes, like when I post a picture of myself doing forward flexion, I'm showing you my best set. Yeah. At the end of my workout, when I'm really warmed up, I'm not showing my worst effort. Like the idea is to show what's possible and to, you know, create a pattern interrupt where somebody that's scrolling through Instagram goes, oh, whoa, look at that. Yeah. So, you know, to be looking at the extreme of what people can achieve and say, oh, well, what? no one can do that. I mean, that's just ridiculous. You know, the idea is, is to create a little bit of a, um, you know, an insight into, oh, this is what can be yeah. achieved. And then, and then maybe to challenge you and think, well, am I doing anything that is working towards that? And then if you want to know more, then, you know, start slow. And the and key, I think the key that we're not saying enough, which we should say probably every sentence is progressive overload. Yeah. It's a, it, especially when doing things that train the spine or any part of your body really, but something that you have a compromise in right now, uh, whether that's spine, wrist, elbow, shoulder, knee, whatever, is about fo regressing back to the point that's going to stimulate the, the the compromised area sufficiently and then progressively uh, overloading. And some people that. have, like sometimes the progressive overload is, is even less about the structures and more about the brain yeah. um, and about just getting you like comfortable with the idea of even bending over because there's some people who are, you know have had sort of back injuries in the past that are so resistant to doing any sort of lumbar spine flexion and if people don't know what the Jefferson curl is and hopefully they understand now but it's yeah basically the ultimate sort of loaded spinal uh, flexion so for, like in physio you know we'd start with progressions where you'd even just be getting people lying on the spine on their back um, and just like doing a posterior pelvic tilt to introduce some um, some level of like lumbar flexion in a position which their brain can kind of chill out and be like okay yeah. I'm lying down 
there's no like yeah. <laughs> I've only got a load of my pelvis that yeah. is going to be exerting that sort of spinal flexion course. And if if that's the, st- the st- like place you need to start at because you're so freaked out about any amount of bending, then start there. But don't stop there. And yeah, that's the thing that's which right. so many physios do is they get kind of stuck in this like yeah. you know hyperprotective mode, yeah. which is yeah. you know again as we talked about yesterday with like we have you know legal <laughs> insurance kind of stuff always hanging over us about you know potentially causing some um, you know do no harm. Ex- but yeah, if you're starting from there and you're, you're working through a like progressive, um, you know, there's no reason why you should. Yeah, stop there yeah, absolutely. And that's uh, I mean, I've worked with people who have sev- have had severely compromised spines and even the smallest amount of movement, you know, they hobble into the gym and they're terrified of movement because the, where they're at, any movement causes discomfort. Uh, but you have to, you have to get it moving, and you have well, to. Well, I've slowly. been one of those people. Yeah, so I, I, I. I've been yeah. one of those people. I've yeah. been someone at my worst. Um, I, I don't think I've ever even said this before, but the the worst that my spine was was when I was about a year or so into martial arts training, and I threw it out so badly or spasmed it, whatever you want to call it, because I didn't get it. Ba- I didn't get definitely didn't get a scan on it or anything, but my symptoms. The pain that I was feeling was so bad that for uh, several days, I was on a couch, unable to get comfortable. I was in chronic pain. And if I tried to move anywhere, it was sharp, stabbing, shooting pains that were agonizing. Mm. And after that, there was several weeks where I had to walk with a walking stick. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I can't remember exactly how long it was, but it was weeks. It was a prolonged period of time where I had to walk with a walking stick because if I put pressure on one leg without the support of the walking stick, the pain was so bad that I couldn't tolerate it. That was when I was a teenager in my late teens. And it wasn't until when I was in the army and I had that really bad fall that I got scans and they said, oh, well, you've got this, this and this going on in your back. But by that time, I'd pursued a a movement because the good thing about martial arts, at least Kung Fu, you guys have seen it. There's so much movement in it. Like it's a, it's a martial art that really takes your body through a lot of movement. And when I was younger and I didn't know anything about training except martial arts, all I knew is that if I stopped doing Kung Fu for about a week, my back got really bad. Mm. And when I started doing Kung Fu again, because Kung Fu has so much rotation in it and you know, yeah. you don't move your spine like that, but you're moving around all the yeah. time, you know? Um, yeah, it was, uh, so I've been one of those people. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been I, someone I've that- I've had the same. I've been, I've been, completely um incapacitated by um uh flare-ups with my back and it's it's an awful feeling but what i can guarantee you is that you you know not moving it is like the worst thing you can do and you've got to slowly and what phil said is very true it's not just physical adaptation that needs to occur it's also this psychological adaptation that needs to sort of take place for you to build confidence and And i think that's kind of one part of why the jefferson curl and, and the deadlifts can be such powerful um, you know, exercises because you do get so much psychological confidence to be like, wow, like, I you know, can do I this, can yeah. lift yeah. up this way yeah. or I can do that. I'm like, capable. you know, I have a strong, resilient spine and yeah. like that's, I think, so psychological. And, you know, with it all we keep talking about with pain science, like your perceived threat of a structure is very much led to your, is your pain, basically. So if you can be like, wow, you know, my spine is sturdy, strong, mobile, then yeah. that's going to make you and, feel whole And better. they're also so good because they're both so easily progressively overloaded. Mm. You can really choose the exact load that you want, choose exactly. the reps that you want, choose yeah. the yeah. time under tension, like all, like there's, the variables are really easily manipulated. So they're, they're, they're just such great exercises. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, sorry to uh, interrupt because we do need to bring it in for a landing. Um, I want to just, uh, I, I guess, highlight the th- the, the three key messages that we've covered in today's podcast, which is you should be moving your spine in all sorts of different directions to reconnect to the systems and the muscles and the stabilizers. Yeah. Life doing, is variable. So yeah, life is variable. So the spinal mo- mo- mobilization drills, the spinal mobility drills that we do um, in our warm up and in the um, spine mobility masterclass, they are like at the ground roots. This the thing that you can do a little bit of every single day because they're not super taxing. They're not overloading. It's just about reconnecting to the brain to muscle essentially and 
and taking your body and your spine into every different sort of direction that it's capable of on a regular basis so that you're prepared for it if it happens in life. Next, you want to be training it in um, ice, in, in uh, like a static, uh, rigid structure, things like deadlifts, squats, big movements, even, even uh, bench press, because we do the arch back position, you're going to be tensing and bracing and holding. And that's something that the spine really likes to do uh, against um, uh, a sagittal um, load, like a squat or a deadlift, and also against a rotational load. Uh, and you can load it in anti-rotation for that. And then finally, you want to be eventually building up to loading it in flexion and extension. So you actually want to buck that trend and start to flex the spine under load, doing things like Jefferson curls, doing um, um, loaded um, side flexion a little bit, things like that, you know. Um, and so there's three ways to train the spine that is going to best prepare you for actual life. Because as Phil's pointed out um, so eloquently and astutely, life is variable. You know, you cannot expect to not injure your back or flare up your back or sp um, cause cramping and, and spasms in your back if you're only training it in one way. And you certainly can expect to experience problems if you're not training it at all. Love it. Good Tune in tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to bring this in for a landing. Uh, the big topic for tomorrow is every day is spine day. Yep. Um, and I love that one because, you know, if you're a gym junkie, you'll know what we mean. Like it's like squat day <laughs> or it's or it's bench day. Well, I just gave a huge day, hint away there yeah. with what we finished up with. Yeah, yeah there's yeah. so many different ways. And because there's so many different ways to train the spine. Every day is spine every day. Every day is spine day. You're yeah. going to be training it every single day if you do a good program like the UMS. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> good little, yeah. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining us on the live, everyone. UMS Movement Mastermind. Big shout out to everyone tuning in on the Sound of Movement podcast. And for those of you over on YouTube, we love you. We appreciate you. Keep subscribing and liking our stuff. Yeah, and keep asking questions because yeah. we'd like to help. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Who, who would have thought? Yeah. Have a good day, everyone. Health is about performance, not just body image. You better be willing to accept <laughs> what you're going to have to do to get there. We'll start focusing on movement goals, strength goals, flexibility goals. When you nail that skill, it's there forever. The body image goal doesn't get you that it's far. It's the consistency and frequency that's going to get you there. It's not the intensity. There's no shortcuts to mastery and movement. Destination doesn't change overnight, but your direction will. It's the gym is not the place to beat up the body that you hate. It's the place to build the body that you love. We are the gym that teaches people how to move instead of just exercise because we believe that health is about performance, not just body image. Same frequency that's gonna get you there. It's not the intensity. There's no shortcuts to mastery and movement.